And it's my great pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce our next speaker, a scholar whose work has had a great influence in the field of American history, but also in my own work. So it's kind of an extra pleasure for me. Michael Kazin is professor of history in the Department of History at Georgetown University. He's an expert in US politics and social movements in the 19th and 20th centuries. Professor Kazin received his PhD from Stanford University. And since that time, he has gone on to publish many significant works related to the field of history, uh, of politics, social movements, and social reform, including A Godly Hero, The Life of William Jennings Bryan, America Divided, uh, The Civil War of the 1960s, co-authored with Maurice Isserman, and The Populist Persuasion, An American History. I have a very worn copy of that book in my office. And uh, most recent book is American Dreamers, How the Left Changed a Nation, uh, which came out in 2011. Professor Kazin is also the co-editor of Dissent, a leading magazine of the American left since 1954. He has also published articles and book reviews and opinion pieces in places such as The New Republic, The American Prospect, and The New York Times. Professor Kazin has received many awards and honors for his scholarship, including prestigious fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson Center. This afternoon, Professor Kazin will speak to us on the topic of Michael Harrington and the fate of social democracy in America. Please join me in welcoming Michael Kazin. Thanks, Ed, for that very nice introduction. Um, and thanks to everybody who uh, put together, Tom and others who put together this wonderful uh, uh, celebration and uh, discussion and analysis of Michael Harrington's work and life. Um, and I, I hope that uh, this conference might play a small part in reviving uh, the importance of poverty, of fighting poverty um, in our nation. So if it can play any, any small part in that, it'll be wonderful, uh, even more wonderful than just uh, the intellectual uh, and political stimulation that we're getting uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, the, one of the uh, disabilities of, of speaking last, there'll be a panel uh, after us, as you know, after me, as you know, but one of the, one of the perils of speaking last is, is that so many smart things have been said already uh, by uh, very fine speakers, and some of those things I'm going to repeat, <laughs> uh, not knowing what they were going to say, of course. Uh, but, you know, some important things are worth saying twice, sometimes even three times. So, uh, but if, if you've been here all day and you want to go out and get a beer, feel free. Come back at 5 o'clock, though. Um, my talk, as, the, uh, as advertised, is about social democracy. And uh, this term sounds rather exotic in the context of American history. Um, but it has a very important meaning, I think, not just in US history, but also in world history, and, of course, in Michael Harrington's life. When we think about social democracy, two rather different conceptions may come to mind. The first is a radical political vision, Michael Harrington's vision, which has been completely unrealized in the United States um, and only partly realized in a few other nations, particularly those in Northern and Western Europe. This kind of society, uh, you might say, uh, represents a kind of marriage between uh, the best of socialism, as Marx and Engels understood it and advocated it, and the merits of a market system. It features an advanced welfare state with cradle-to-grave protection for its citizens, encouragement of entrepreneurs but strict regulation of the corporations they form, strong unions representing a majority of the working population, and a political order which is fully democratic and which preaches and practices cultural pluralism and the free exercise of individual rights. This kind of social democracy is also strongly opposed to the use of force in foreign uh, or domestic affairs. It seeks to establish a world order dedicated to the peaceful resolution of international disputes. This social democracy had its origins in arguments made back in the 1890s by Eduard Bernstein, a leading figure in the early decades of the German socialist movement. Arguments which were highly controversial on the left at the time and continue to be for uh, several decades afterwards. Against the conventional wisdom of orthodox Marxists, Bernstein argued that capitalism was not destined to undergo a fatal crisis and would not inevitably be replaced by a new order run by working people. Because capitalism, however flawed, was likely to have a long and perhaps robust life 
Bernstein argued that socialists should work for gradual improvements in the system and develop cross-class coalitions whenever possible. In the 1920s, after the horrors of World War I and the Bolsheviks' bloody consolidation of power in Russia, Bernstein's revisionist point of view, as it came to be called, became the implicit and increasingly the explicit doctrine of nearly every socialist party in Europe and North America. In the United States, there was a long, distinguished line of notable social democrats of this kind, from Victor Berger and Morris Hilquit, to Norman Thomas and A. Philip Randolph, to Michael Harrington himself. But since Michael's death, there has been no one of prominence in American politics to take up this cause. DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, which has a table full of wonderful literature uh, just to the left uh, of the door out there, um, is a social democratic uh, organization in this sense. But sadly, not many Americans who are not on the left even know the DSA exists. At times, Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont has called himself a socialist. But if the senator from Vermont has spoken about his larger political ends of late, it hasn't drawn much notice. Notwithstanding his official status as an independent, Bernie Sanders speaks and votes like a liberal Democrat, albeit an unusually rigorous liberal Democrat. But the kind of social democracy which Harrington and his forerunners stood for is, in the American context, quite a bit more radical. The second conception of social democracy is not really radical at all. It's an alternative name for what most people in the United States simply call liberalism. Some commentators use this kind of social democracy to, social democracy to suggest the similarity of liberal ideology and politics to the ideas and policies which are supposedly practiced in the welfare states of Europe, or at least were until the current crisis in the Eurozone and the punishing wave of austerity those nations are undergoing. According to this definition of social democracy, the New Deal and the Great Society were both social democratic. In the United States, both sympathizers and critics of liberalism are fond of the term, or at least have been more recently. Do one of those Google searches and you see the term rising in um, prominence over the last uh, three or four years, especially. This social democracy is what Mitt Romney is talking about. You've heard of him, I think. When he says that President Obama, quote, wants to turn America into a European-style entitlement society. Although the Affordable Care Act, um, which, uh, Obama, which uh, Romney is criticizing, is not at all like the single-payer system which operates in places like Great Britain, France, and Sweden, as, of course, your former governor is well aware. In the US, the first definition of social democracy, Harrington's definition, is aspirational. It's imbued with utopian idealism, the hope of bringing to birth a new world from the exploitative chaos of the old. In the US, this kind of social democracy has usually been a marginal faith. The second definition is, for all intents and purposes, the platform of the Democratic Party. For most of his political and intellectual career, Michael Harrington tried to straddle the gap between these two conceptions of political change. Like Bernstein, he analyzed the past and present as a creative Marxist, always seeking to discover the shortcomings and contradictions of capitalism, which might nudge the nation closer to socialism. He had also stationed himself on what he famously called the left wing of the possible, one of his most favorite, famous phrases, of course. He worked energetically inside the civil rights movement, the movement to end the war in Vietnam, the labor movement, and he campaigned for Democrats who sought to tilt the balance a bit further towards a greater equality of both rights and wealth. Harrington desired with all his heart to develop a democratic socialist society and wrote several luminous books to explain what that new society should look like and how it might come about. But he was equally dedicated to building coalitions to support liberal goals, ones which could be achieved with, with durable electoral majorities instead of requiring a moral and structural transformation. In effect, my talk today is about how he and other social democrats straddled uh, this inevitable gulf between the visionary and the practical. Harrington tried to craft a hybrid of the ideal and the practical, to create a social democracy that would be relevant to the changing nature of American society. In the final chapter of his final book, which he wrote literally on his deathbed, he called this hybrid visionary gradualism. Dave O'Brien quoted that earlier today. To understand how difficult and yet courageous 
that task was requires, I think, a brief look backward at the history of that political faith before Michael actually became a socialist uh, and it's most, the most prominent apostle of social democracy in America. So uh, I apologize for a little uh, deep context, if you will, going before uh, Michael's time. The most successful social democrats in U.S. history belong to the Socialist Party of America. During its heyday, from its formation in 1901 to its painful, irrevocable split just after World War I. These socialists governed for various lengths of time 33 American cities, from Berkeley in the west to Schenectady in the east, as well as dozens of smaller towns, like my favorite example, a little town called Antlers, Oklahoma, had a socialist mayor. But most socialists were elected not because they were socialists, but because they stood for the fair treatment, fair treatment uh, of government to all residents and a caring, honest government. They did not want to, they did not vote socialists because they wanted to abolish the capitalist system. Most of them, they voted socialist because they thought socialists would be better um, engineers of the state, better managers of the state, the local state in most cases. Once elected, socialists tried to deliver on this promise with factory inspections, public hospitals, new schools and working class neighborhoods, and a police force that remained neutral during strikes. Now some of their socialist comrades at the time who were anxious for a proletarian uprising, scoffed that all this was what they called sewer socialism, because you make the sewers run better, and you care about better sewers. Not itself a bad idea <laughs> if you live in the city. But nevertheless, this was a, a term of opprobrium. It was a condemnation. According to these more radical socialists, all the social democrats were doing was presenting a mess of palliatives, which could only delay the demise of an evil system. As it happens, few socialists at the time stayed in local office long enough to rebut their critics. Uh, but a few did, uh, most notably those in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, in Milwaukee, um, socialists governed the city for uh, over two decades at different times in the early part, decades of the 20th century. Um, almost half the population of Milwaukee were either German-speaking immigrants or their children. Um, they were uh, inspired by the German Socialist Party, which at the time, before World War I, was the largest socialist party in the world and really the, the um, uh, citadel of democratic socialism uh, in the world. Uh, Bernstein, of course, was one of the leaders of that party. Uh, and so the, the uh, Socialist Party in uh, Milwaukee, uh, the Social Democratic Party, as it was called, uh, followed the revisionist approach that was uh, gaining approval in Germany and in some other parts of the European socialist world as well. Uh, Milwaukee socialists organized unions of skilled workers, uh, always taking care not to insist that local unions endorse socialist nominees for city or state office. Uh, Milwaukee socialists drew up an elaborate platform of measures that could be passed um, in a capitalist system, ranging from the creation of public slaughterhouses and hospitals to care for the trees that blossomed on the streets of their city. They did at the same time promise that, quote, socialism will someday entirely remove the causes of evil in the world. However, much like liberal Protestants referring to the second coming, they didn't really spend much time dwelling on that wonderful uh, future. According to Victor Berger, who was the unrivaled leader of the local Milwaukee movement, quote, we should not let out of our sight even for a moment the real sentiment of the masses. Nothing more ought to be demanded than is attainable at a given time and under given circumstances. In other words, socialism, according to Berger, would advance one small victory at a time. Excuse me, it's hot up here. 1910, almost a century ago, more than a century ago, Berger's wisdom seemed borne out at the polls. That spring, the Social Democrats, whose vote had steadily increased since the turn of the century, defeated both capitalist parties. They elected a union woodworker uh, to the mayoralty of Milwaukee, which was then the eighth largest city in the country. They also elected a majority on the city council. That November, 1910, Berger completed the triumph when he won a seat in Congress becoming the first socialist ever elected to the U.S. Congress. There haven't been very many. But soon, the party faithful realized how modest the attainable could be. The socialists wanted to turn Milwaukee into a model of municipal ownership that their counterparts elsewhere in the nation could emulate. 
But the state government of Wisconsin, run by progressives like Robert La Follette, resisted these changes, citing various laws that prohibited them, various state laws that overrode uh, local ordinances. So the Milwaukee elected officials, elected by socialists, um, had to be satisfied with enacting less ambitious reforms, like winning an eight-hour day for city workers. In the next election, a fusion ticket, Democrats and Republicans got together to defeat the socialists, relegated them to minority status. But that defeat was not permanent. In 1916, a socialist named Daniel Hone took back the mayor's office and held it continuously until 1940. However, Gradually, but surely, uh, any socialist content uh, in Hone's uh, discourse, any socialist content in the kind of platforms that he was pushing pretty much disappeared. The number, number of German board radicals uh, was in swift decline, and the old Marxist vision pretty much expired. By the 1930s, uh, during Hone's last term, which was during the New Deal, a very reform-minded period, of course, in American history, uh, Hone's program and rhetoric was almost indistinguishable from that of liberal mayors like Fiorello LaGuardia in New York City. And Social Democrats have never governed a major American city ever again. From the 1920s until its end in 1972, though it's been revived recently, the Socialist Party continued, with rare exceptions, to espouse the kind of social democracy that had motivated the party in Milwaukee and elsewhere. But socialists also had to spend a good deal of time and energy distinguishing themselves from communists. Not much has been said about this aspect of the history of uh, socialism and about uh, Michael's own history uh, today, so I want to dwell on it a little bit. Before World War I, many American socialists had lived in neighborhoods uh, or toiled in workplaces where the rights of labor had almost sacred meaning. They knew exactly what they were fighting for. But after the First World War, bitter disagreements on the left about the Soviet Union threw that certainty into question. Was the Soviet Union socialist? Was it a, degraders, a degraded worker state? Uh, there are many different terms various socialist factions and communist factions had for what had happened. But the debate about the nature of the Soviet Union, the debate about communism, uh, as many of you know, roiled the left and also did great damage to the Socialist Party. Uh, communists captured a large chunk of the Socialist constituency. Um, the CIO's support for liberal Democrats uh, in the 30s made clear the labor movement was not going to join a Socialist third party of any kind. Um, and battling with the communists, social democrats often risk seeming lacking in idealism and commitment to fighting for a radical new order. It was the communists who were the radicals. It was the communists who wanted to overhaul uh, capitalist society. Socialists wanted something less. At least that was the image that often was put forth. And in their hatred of communism, socialists sometimes made alliances with powerful liberals who were more interested in advancing the self-interest of the United States than vanquishing the totalitarian distortion of Marx's vision. Still, this was an absolutely necessary battle to wage. Not only was communism a catastrophe for most of the people who lived under its rule, resulting in the needless deaths of millions of people and the failure of centralized states to motivate workers to produce enough quality goods to compete with capitalist economies, but communism had a destructive impact on the very idea the socialism meant the potential to create a more democratic and egalitarian society. So to be both a principled social democrat and a principled anti-communist, which is what Michael Harrington was, required a very difficult balancing act. You had to be critical both of your own government and social system and of the most powerful and influential alternatives to that social system, that is liberal capitalism. What's more, anti-communist radicals had no major organization, no common spokesperson, and no easily articulated message. Figures like Walter Ruther and Martin Luther King Jr. were social democrats, to be sure, but in Cold War America, they didn't publicize that fact. So the task of combining a radical social, demo a ra radical social democracy and uh, anti-communism, principal anti-communism, was often uh, left to a handful of periodicals. Um, Dwight MacDonald uh, edited one called Politics for a while in the 1940s. The one I now co-edit with Michael Walzer was another one in 1954. Irving Howe, one of the first editors, famously said about dissent, uh, when radical intellectuals can't think of anything else to do, they start a magazine. Um, Michael Harrington contributed over 60 articles and reviews to dissent. Uh, 
in about 30 years as a contributor. That runs to about two every year. That is one every other issue, um, in effect. Most of them are pretty long articles. Parenthetically, I, I, I don't understand, I don't, I'd like to understand, maybe Morris can uh, explain to us later on, how Michael was able to sleep and uh, have a family, have love affairs, uh, drink a lot, <laughs> uh, as well as do all he did. Um, um, now, a little bit about, about uh, dissent's anti-communism, which Michael was very much a part of. Um, first of all, dissent defined anti-communism uh, much the way um, and defined socialism, uh, of course, much the way social democrats uh, like Michael did. Um, they defined socialism, quote, as a belief in the dignity of the individual. Belief in the dignity of the individual. That is not how the Bolsheviks defined socialism. And, quote, a refusal to countenance one man's gain at the expense of his brother. They denounced Soviet communism, but they made clear that the rivalry between the U.S. and the USSR was an imperialist rivalry. 1954, the first year of dissent, they ran a piece by Norman Mailer, who was then a contributing editor to dissent, who argued that industrialization in the Soviet Union was exploitative at its core. Um, it was another kind of um, exploitation, uh, no different and no better than capitalism. The value of this worldview, I think, was evident in dissent's analysis of communist regimes in Eastern Europe. In 1982, at a public meeting, I think in Town Hall in New York, Susan Sontag made the controversial statement, quote, someone who read only the Reader's Digest between 1950 and 1970 would have been better informed about the realities of communism than someone in the same period who read only the, the Nation or the New Statesman. She got booed when she made that comment. But dissent would have been an even better option, I think, than Reader's Digest. In the 1950s, dissent was publishing translations of Soviet dissidents, it was hailing the spirit of the vanquished, as they called it, of Hungarians and East Germans who were waging a losing battle against state tyranny in their countries. In the 1960s, the Senate published dozens of articles by and about left-wing Democrats, social Democrats from around the region, including Milovan Zilas from Yugoslavia and Vaclav Havel from what was then Czechoslovakia. 20 years later, when all the European communist regimes had clattered into history's dustbin, Irving Howe, the editor of Dissent, was in no mood to declare victory. Of course, he wrote, the West had won a decisive victory. But aside from the welfare state programs already in place, the future of the social democratic left was very much in doubt. Alas, wrote Howe, we continue to pay for the crimes of Stalinism. For vast numbers of people, socialism means in Europe, for vast numbers of people, vast numbers of people in Europe, excuse me, socialism means what they have lived under or seen in Russia and Eastern Europe. If indeed that is socialism, they are quite right to reject it utterly. Irving Howe was one of Michael Harrington's closest friends, and Michael agreed uh, completely about his views uh, on these issues. But he didn't spend much time in his career detailing the brutalities and disasters of communism. He left that to others for the most part, though he wrote about them in his books, certainly. He was too busy trying to promote the synthesis of a radical social democracy and a reform agenda fit for the Protean realities of American politics. This often felt like a quixotic effort. In The Long Distance Runner, Harrington's second and final memoir, he recalled how he invited Democratic delegates to a socialist breakfast at a 1974 midterm party convention. Sounds quaint today, a socialist breakfast. Um, then, as he put it in his memoir, he stood nervously embarrassed in an almost empty room until the time came to end an event that never should have been begun. Harrington was not bitter. He was never, I don't think, a bitter man. But he knew that social democracy in the United States has been a more convenient threat to be exploited by the right and center than a true movement that might someday come to power. I am running toward the kingdom of humanity, he wrote in his last memoir. I know perfectly well I will never see it. Perhaps no one will. His achievement as a social democrat, I think, was still considerable. He never ran for political office, as did Debs and Norman Thomas, but he combined really impressive rhetorical powers with an informed analytic intelligence, equally at home among academics, liberal politicians, and blue-collar workers. I heard Michael speak only twice, I think, in my life, but each time I was silent at the end of it. I couldn't imagine hearing a better speaker. In thousands of articles and speeches and 16 books, he argued for his views with great passion and persistence.
Now, in any Western European country, France, Sweden, Denmark, one can imagine many of them, a man with similar skills and accomplishments would have been a serious candidate for high government office, or at least head of a national labor federation. In fact, Harrington was welcomed abroad with enthusiasm. He was a significant participant in the Socialist International, which despite its, its name is, was really nothing more than a debating society, but among leading um, uh, political figures all over Western Europe and other parts of the world as well. Uh, he wrote resolutions for the Social International on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He got to know such figures as Olaf Palma from Sweden, uh, Shimon Peres from Israel, and Felipe Gonzalez from Spain, who governed their countries uh, at different times. He traveled throughout the world as the honored guest of governments. But in the United States, Harrington was just the only socialist whose name more than a few Americans could recognize. How could he persist in pursuing his seemingly hopeless vision? Harrington traced his political passion to what he called the mystery of his inner self. As a Marxist, he seemed kind of uneasy <laughs> making such a statement about the inner self. But he recalled being astounded when his own sons were born. He wrote, they seemed to emerge from the womb with personalities. And so did Harrington himself, who told of giving away his lunch money in kindergarten and thought of his life as, quote, a trust to be used for a good purpose and accounted for when it was over. Now, obviously, just to hear that phrase, um, um, clearly the, the impact of his Catholic faith uh, was there. And other people have talked about this as well. So let me just repeat in different words what other folks said earlier. In the early 50s, of course, Harrington had been drawn to the Catholic worker movement, which was, as he wrote, as far left as you could go within the church. Um, he became a socialist in age 52 and confessed to Dorothy Day that he had lost his faith. But the intensity and the steadfastness of his vision was always, I think, akin to a religious calling. Um, David O'Brien was talking about that today. Uh, others have mentioned it as well. And in the other America, the first person acknowledged is Dorothy Day in the acknowledgments on the first page. Um, so Michael was a Marxist with a religious sensibility. His internal conflicts helped him keep a balance between ideology and humanity, between utopianism and practical politics. As such, it placed him more within the tradition of his socialist predecessors in the United States than he may have realized. When jailed for opposing U.S. involvement in World War I, for example, Eugene Debs kept one picture in his cell in the Atlanta Penitentiary, that of Jesus Christ. Um, there's an essay I, I had out to my students about uh, Jesus Christ, in which Debs says, it's written in 1914, Debs said, Jesus Christ was the world's one true communist. He meant that before uh, the Bolshevik Revolution as a great compliment. For Norman Thomas, as many of you know, the wellsprings of his radical faith came out of his early years as a Presbyterian minister in East Harlem, committed to the social gospel. For Michael, to the end of his life, he called himself a, quote, pious apostate, an atheist fellow traveler of moderate Catholicism. This stance allowed him to seek common ground with reform-minded believers. He wrote in The Politics of God's Funeral, a book that is not much read today, but deserves to be, I think, Quote, the atheistic humanist and the committed religious person have the same enemy. That slack, hedonistic, and thoughtless, thoughtless atheism, which often embellished with a sentimental religiosity, is the real faith of contemporary Western society. I love the fact he includes the sentimental religiosity, close to what uh, Alan was talking about uh, in the last talk we mentioned Rick Warren. Like many progressive believers, Harrington blamed the market system for undermining the ideal of the common good. He condemned a faddish relativism for producing human beings who, quote, no longer know what they believe, but want desperately to believe in something. He even proposed what he called a united front of believers and atheists in defense of moral values. A moral majority, you might say. <laughs> Harrington's quasi-spiritual ethical vision occasionally separated him from the pragmatic liberals with whom he worked in unions and the Democratic Party. And for many of the social democrats who at times governed Canadian provinces and European nations. Toward the end of his life, he wrote, quote, while listening to Box Goldberg variations, there are moments when I temporarily believe in God again and weep for joy 
This was a deeply ambivalent man in some ways about his spirituality, I think. Yet his utopianism was always tempered by caution about the quest. He wrote, whenever political movements go in search of a messianic perfection, they end up either in triviality or totalitarianism. In the early 1960s, he devoted his energies to aiding the emerging black freedom movement. He stayed mostly in the North, helping to organize civil rights demonstrations, including the Great March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. He worked closely with Barry Rustin, a fellow social democrat, and briefly represented a Rustin-led group called the Committee to Defend Martin Luther King. That's, I mentioned that to my students. Uh, no, none of my students today, whatever they think of King, think he needs defense. <laughs> Everybody loves Martin Luther King, though not always uh, because of the right reasons. These experiences, I think, helped teach Harrington a sensitivity to black grievances and aspirations. That was unusual among white social Democrats at the time. In 1960, Clarence Jones, a black attorney and activist in Los Angeles, told Barry Rustin, quote, have great respect for Mike. Complete freedom of Negro people not far off would have dedicated white people of his caliber. I think that was a telegram. Harrington also understood that repealing Jim Crow laws was just the first step to redeeming the sin of American racism. Listen to this sentence in 1961, written for dissent, as it happens. Just as the civil rights movement was growing, just as the freedom rides were hitting um, the papers, and of course the bodies of freedom riders were hitting the streets in the South, quote, after the racist statutes are all struck down, after legal equality has been achieved in the schools and the courts, there will yet remain the profound, institutionalized, and abiding wrong which white America has worked on the Negro for centuries. 1961, before all those laws were passed. And the other America, as was mentioned before, Harrington sought to, sought to strike the same balance between fixing a contemporary social problem and proposing a long-range radical alternative to the system which produced it. As Morris mentioned before, he wrote later, I'd made the decision not to talk about socialism in the other America, because that would deflect attention from the poor. Indeed, what struck most reviewers and readers about the book was, as Dwight MacDonald wrote in that famous review in The New Yorker, the wealth of imaginative detail that described better than anyone ever had what it means to be poor in this country today. But the other America, as Tom mentioned before, can still be read as a brief for fundamental structural change, for creating another and far better America. Harrington proposed government-sponsored medical care, increased welfare benefits, stronger unions, a higher minimum wage, and new public housing located, and this is important, in existing and vital neighborhoods, not in slums. He also called for what he called a vast social movement that could convince organized labor and liberals to transform the Democratic Party, to promote what he called a spirit and a line that communicates itself to the entire society. In effect, he hoped the other America would inspire the construction of a sturdy bridge between reform and social democracy. But of course, that ambition was continuously thwarted by the marginal position of socialism in the United States. So Harrington had to keep pulling back from vision to compromise fearing that otherwise radicals like himself would be estranged from one or more of the major constituencies that uh, undergirded the New Deal coalition. And this often created a conflict between the range of his goals and the moderation of his methods. In 1968, for example, he struck a radical tone, writing, quote, the American system doesn't seem to work anymore. He warned, the pragmatic, anti-ideological United States of America is in the embarrassing position of having to take some steps toward a new civilization or else. Here, Harrington sounds more like Tom Hayden than Lyndon Johnson. Yet his methods remain squarely in the liberal mainstream. There was the vision, and there was the methods. He had, for example, sharp disputes with the first leaders of Students for Democratic Society, SDS, over what he considered their naivete about communism and their skepticisms about the central role organized labor had to play in any left revival. Unlike the new left, he worked hard to cobble together electoral majorities. Perhaps, he wrote in 1966, angry young leftists might realize it is wrong to confuse a tough-minded and empirical willingness to face society as it is with a lack of principle. Sometimes Harrington stumbled in the difficult maneuvers required to straddle the visionary and the practical. My favorite example of this is in 1970. He came out with a big book entitled simply Socialism, 
which I'm afraid I don't think is still in print. Um, and this book, he famously, or for some people, infamously argued that organized labor, quote, was a mass social democratic movement in America in a pro-capitalist, anti-socialist disguise. So it was a subversively social democratic movement that was afraid to speak its name. Unfortunately, this invisible mass movement was not just one that dared not speak its name. At the time Harrington's book was published in 1970, most labor leaders were dubious about any alliance with avowed radicals. A quarter century of Cold War, after a quarter century of Cold War, socialism remained, remained anathema to the great majority of American wage earners. Labor was not a hidden socialist movement, uh, as they saw it. Though Harrington did not recant his objections to the new left's anti-anti-communism, he did confess he'd been guilty of what he called a rude insensitivity to young people struggling to define a new identity when he had rejected their positions as abruptly and passionately as he did. But by, by the time he made that statement, by the time he made those amends with the new left, the radical energy of the 1960s and early 70s was largely spent. Of course, Harrington and his fellow social democrats did enjoy some successes. They were key activists in all the major social movements of the late, uh, of the last half of the 20th century. They helped bring an end to segregation, as Michael did, and the Vietnam War. They helped to articulate the aims of feminism and gay liberation. They helped oppose the nuclear arms race. But these victories, some of them partial, owed more to the concentrated anger of particular social groups and a temporary coalition of the aggrieved than to analysis and planning by social democrats whether intellectuals and activists uh, like Michael or others. And Harrington's continued reliance on organized labor as the indispensable basis of any liberal alliance was bound to be disappointed. By the 1980s, his last decade of life, the decline of the industrial working class and a politically astute, well-funded assault from the right had thrown unionists on the defensive, not to speak of the kind of structural changes that Tom spoke about so well in, in his uh, address uh, earlier. And of course, unions still struggle to emerge today. Hardly anybody today would say unions are the, will be the core of uh, a new progressive revival. One reason Harrington was unable to translate what he called the need for the transcendental, he cared so much about in, in, into political practice, was that he was so reasonable. The persistence of poverty, the lack of adequate medical care and housing, the trap of dangerous or alienating jobs, terror employed by governments of all political persuasions. These are matters he knew how to document. He knew how to expose. He could offer social policies that would address and perhaps even solve them. But how could he, with his rational analysis and atheistic faith, have reached the unemployed worker who votes for Rick Santorum? How could he have explained why millions of poor men and women follow fundamentalist clerics in the Muslim world, in Israel, and here in the United States? The late journalist David Broder once told Michael, you people are just too sane. <laughs> but Harrington never gave up hope for the revival of his vision of social democracy. In 1970, he wrote, I think perhaps prophetically, quote, it is quite possible that in the coming period, a maldistributed and antisocial affluence will radicalize more people than hunger ever did. If the Occupy movement endures, it might help make Harrington a true prophet. Certainly, as he understood, popular grievances based on the unfair advantages of wealthy elites have throughout modern history inspired more durable and more powerful social movements than have the outrages of abject poverty. And socialism itself may be, enjoying, it may be enjoying a little bit of a comeback in America. In a recent Pew survey conducted last December, Roughly the same number of 18 to 29-year-olds said they had positive views of socialism as they did of capitalism. Overall, three out of every 10 Americans, 30% overall of all age groups, had a positive reaction to socialism. Only 50% thought warmly about capitalism, while 40% were displeased with capitalism. Now, it would be obviously a mistake to take this and similar polls too seriously. If Bernie Sanders somehow managed to run for president on a socialist ticket, he would be quite unlikely to receive a third of the vote. Most of the Americans who say that like socialism are undoubtedly reacting to the right-wing politicians and talk show hosts who brand Obama a socialist because he signed a bill guaranteeing health insurance to most Americans and because he saved General Motors and Chrysler from going bankrupt. If that is socialist, a lot of people might be saying, well, that's fine with them. 
Um, but this recent tiny bit of surge in interest, at least, in the term socialism, and a little bit of a positive spin on it, uh, might also perhaps give groups like DSA and, and other people who still consider the vision of democratic socialism, social democracy, uh, worth defending and worth articulating, uh, a little bit of, of, a, uh, of an audience. Um, might give people, as Michael certainly wanted to do, uh, a sense that there are other ways to organize society, other options besides the ones presently on offer, which, as I would see it, are a plutocratic republic, um, a defense of liberalism, and state tyranny, none of which are uh, ones that uh, we should favor. As Michael wrote in 1966, the democratization of concentrated economic, social, and political power is the only hope for the achievement of Western humanist ideals, to the possibility of a new order of things in which the people actually decide their own destiny. Thank you, Michael. You alluded to a key aspect of Michael's political thought, uh, which is that being a social democrat is not simply a matter of ideology or policy proposals, it's also being uh, a member of an organization. And from 1952, when he joined the Young People's Socialist League through the 1980s, when he led Democratic Socialists of America, he was never not a member of a socialist organization. In 1952, when he joined uh, the Young People's Socialist League, it had 80 members nationwide, and they considered it a major advance when they had 400 members by the end of the 1950s. And a lot of people who knew Mike and respected him, always sort of wondered why he messed around with these little groups when he was clearly so much bigger than that. And as you said, if he'd been in Europe, he would have been a leader of the Labor Federation or a, a prime minister or, or, or something. Um, and I, I wonder if you could address that. And also um, the question of why, when lots of people do describe themselves as socialists or agree with socialist principles, socialist organizations remain so tiny. And I, I would just suggest one reason that occurs to me is a kind of intense localism in American politics. I mean, all those bumper stickers that say, act globally and uh, act locally <laughs> and think globally or something like that. <laughs> uh, you don't see them saying, you know, join nationally organized socialist groups and, and uh, act locally. Um, so anyway. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. A lot of different ways to answer it. Let me uh, give some short ones. Um, first of all, I think he couldn't imagine coming out of the background he came out of when there were these massive social democratic parties in Europe, not trying at least to form one, or at least not trying to form a group which could form one at some point, and not trying to turn the Democratic Party into more of a social democratic party. Uh, and also, I think he needed people to talk to. You know, He needed to talk to people like Irving Howe. He needed to talk to people like Rustin. He needed to talk for a while to Max Shackman. You know, he needed people who shared his vision um, and who made public that they did. Um, and at one time, you know, that was something which people did uh, without really thinking much about it. If you're a socialist, you, you joined a socialist group. Um, I think uh, more and more, of course, that became a problem. In the 60s, as you know, there was a, a brief period when socialism, again, seemed to be on the agenda, at least intellectually. Socialist Scholars Conference, which is now called the Left Forum, uh, was founded, and uh, people battled over you know, what socialism meant, and a lot of people started joining uh, socialist or even communist groups again, but that didn't last very long. Uh, so I think, I think uh, part of it, uh, I don't know you as his biographer, you know about this better. I, I get the sense that, that he would have felt a little illegitimate going to the social international meetings if he wasn't part of an organization. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a long history um, on, on the left of building counter-institutions to what exists. And if you don't build a counter-institution, then, then you're just an anarchist. Uh, uh, even anarchists built their own kind of institutions. But uh, I mean, how are you going to uh, take over the state and run in the interests of the workers if you don't, if you don't learn how to run an institution of your own uh, to start with? So that's one explanation. The other explanation about not just the failure of socialism, which is an old question in American historiography, as most people here know, but but why people who do agree with social democratic uh, ideas don't join organizations uh, with that name uh, anymore. Um, I think it's you know, partly because uh, 
that term ever since, ever since 1989, uh, which is when Michael died, of course, uh, has been discredited, at least until very recently, um, by the fact that socialism meant communism. Communism uh, is dead, uh, whether you think it should have been dead or not. Of course, Michael did, but even if you thought it should have been dead, you're not going to start an organization called Socialists for This because it's not going to get very far. And the organizations which are still called that, the ISO, the Socialist Workers' Party, the Socialist Labor Party, um, you could fit all the members in this room and still have you know, <laughs> room for a lot more, I think. Well, that's a little bit of exaggeration, but not much. Um, so I think, I think there's really a, a sense in which if you're going to be a socialist, work in, in um, uh, existing institutions like Democratic Party, like, like labor unions, and maybe it's, 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 it's a liability to call yourself a socialist. Now, I'm not a member of DSA anymore. Members of DSA can address that themselves, not to, not to dump on them, but, but um, I think uh, clearly most people who have those views are not members of DSA. If they were, DSA would have about 600,000 members or, or not more. Um, and the local versus national thing, I don't know. There are green parties. There are local independence parties, and so forth. Uh, I think I think the problem is the term socialism. People don't know what it means anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I gave some reasons, I think, why that why that is so. A member of DSA. <laughs> um, I'm actually not gonna. Well, I'm, I am David. I go to Brandeis. Um, I'm here about five other uh, students, and I'm also in DSA. But that's not really relevant to my question. Um, Basically, I've come out of a kind of the classic social democratic pathway. My father is an immigrant socialist. My mother is a Jewish socialist. And I've kind of grown up in this progressive American left where a lot of kids obviously don't identify as socialists, but which kind of translates to not seeing the value of trade unions. And that people kind of either view philanthropy or nonprofits as kind of building this next left. And then you kind of talk about, which kind of scares me, but it's not it would be dishonest to say if it's not true that trade unions won't play that central role in a next left. And I think that's very dangerous to a certain extent that people need to be honest because trade unions still represent the most integrated, most united, most well-funded part of the nonprofit world outside of maybe some churches. So I guess my hard, honest question for you and everyone in this room is like, if trade unions can't play that role, then is there really that much hope for attenuating a right-wing onslaught because I've been with nonprofits and I know they can't fight back in the same ways. I mean, community organizations could do some good but don't have the same strength as massive organizations. But also that unions have share, I mean, I think it's kind of sycophantic to think that unions are share no re responsibility for their own demise in terms of anyone who's actually worked for one can say they're about as, they could be as Soviet-esque as any of the communist parties in terms of a central committee kind of in having their loyal cadre. Um, so I mean, I guess I'm, my question then to reiterate is this like, if you don't see unions being in the future, then what's the point of having these conversations? Um, I, I misspoke. I don't think so. I, I would never say unions are not at all part of the future. They certainly are and I hope will be. I just think the, and other people addressed this earlier today as well, the, the hope, even expectation that people like Michael Harrington had that um, without trade unions at the center of a left, uh, you're not going to have a left, the same fear that you're voicing. Um, they, just, they just couldn't understand how you could have a left. But I think in the 60s, we had a left without trade unions being the center of it. Um, and it had a lot of problems, and we haven't got time to go into, into those problems. Uh, I helped to abet some of those problems myself, I must admit. But, but uh, you know, there's, um, you know, one, one can't avoid the fact that, I mean, I, I'm a historian of social movements, among other things, and, and uh, you know, I keep thinking of, of a, a social movement, which labor, I think, is still, in many ways, still is, certainly um, for a lot of new members. Uh, some of the, you see what happened in Wisconsin, that was certainly a social movement in defense of union rights and so forth. Uh, hard to think of a social movement which has been in, in decline, though gradual for the most part decline, for so many years, coming back, at least in its, sa in its same form. I can't think of any example now, now as a historian, we, we're, we're taught to believe that history does not repeat itself. And, uh, um, but you know, I, it's just it's been a long, it's been a decline for about 50 years now. In many ways, depending how you define decline, and um, of course, all unions aren't the same. Some unions have grown. The SEIU has grown, uh, for example. Uh, some other unions have grown, but for the most part, 
the image of unions is as, some, is as a force whose time has passed for a lot of people, probably most Americans. That's very difficult to fight batter back. At the same time, I think working class organization, um, there are various kinds of working class organizations, working class movements, uh, which don't have to be equated to unions, which are growing. Immigrant rights groups, made up mostly of working people, are, are growing. Um, there are various groups of working women uh, that very uh, ways are growing. Um, there's uh, uh, campus workers I know on a lot of campuses are organizing sometimes uh, to get unions, sometimes uh, just to get a living wage without actually having a union because through the International Labor Relations Board, as we know, it's much harder to get, to get a union uh, than, than it has been, especially uh, if um, Mitt Romney is elected president, it'll be even harder than ever. Um, and so, you know, there's, well, we have to, I think, be creative, as Michael, I think, would have been creative, about thinking about forms of working class uh, organization, uh, or what some people now call middle class, working middle class organization. That term has now replaced working class in political discourse, um, which, which cannot do exactly what unions did, but nevertheless can, do, can, can fulfill the purposes that unions were organized to fulfill, which is to defend working people to improve their lives at the workplace and also outside the workplace at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, Nelson Lichtenstein wrote a very fine book called The State of the Union, which some people might know, a uh, very good labor historian, where he said that in some ways civil rights discourse and, and class action suits had replaced, and civil rights suits had replaced union organizing as a way to defend uh, workers' rights uh, at the workplace. And uh, in some ways, I think that continues to be true. Um, so as always, one has to find forms of organization, institutions which are appropriate to not just the structures um, of, of the time you're organizing in, but also the consciousness of the time. And the two, of course, intermingle uh, in various complicated and interesting ways. Um, I'm, I don't know what those organizations are. Um, of course, I'd like, as many people here would, people to talk about uh, the poor as well as the middle class, <laughs> because uh, that term, as someone mentioned before, has pretty much gone out of, of um, at least mainstream discourse. But uh, you know, I think that, that those, I, I guess I have faith, here's my atheistic faith, I guess I have faith that, that um, such organizations, such institutions will emerge. Um, because in history they always have. Um, I wish I knew what they look like and I wish they would come soon. Uh, let me cite... Um, Jules, hi. Michael Kazin to Michael Kazin, uh, because uh, you wrote a book uh, entitled, uh, very recently, entitled American Dreamers, which says, which central thesis of the book is the left, if you will, succeeded brilliantly in, the, in this country on all kinds of fronts, uh, from women's suffrage uh, to the labor move, the emergence of the labor movement, and the peace movement and the civil rights movement. And merely because elections weren't won didn't mean we didn't succeed. And the point for me is that the socialist movement in this country has been a meeting ground for people to see things comprehensively. So to give you a simple example, in 1957 or 58 or 59, a handful of socialists sat around and said, well, let's, with the help of Dr. King, let's get Dr. King involved. It was Mike and Bayard Rustin and, uh, and said, let's have a youth march for integrated schools in 58 and a prayer pilgrimage uh, for integrated schools in 59. And that all kind of, and let's remember that Randolph despite the fact that it was also the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which he was never a sleeping car porter, of course, he was a socialist radical with a newspaper in Harlem opposed to World War I. So uh, <clears throat> what my point simply is this, the March on Washington came out of the effort of a handful of socialists who had a vision of how to affect change. And the morning of that thing, Byard was worried that nobody would show up. And of course, there were 250,000 people. Uh, <clears throat> another group, 
Interfaith Worker Justice. I'm on the board. We have, we just put out a book or a new edition of a book by Kim Bobo called Wage Theft. Well, working people in this country are deprived of billions of dollars out of their paychecks every year. And there is an army, there's a class struggle going on in the courts in this country in which thousands of lawyers are representing tens of thousands of workers to get their payback in Fair Labor Standards Act cases. So it's, you know, the, it's not invisible, I mean, it's not invisible, the struggle's going on all the time. And I think the socialists have played a very critical role in making this happen. And Mike, to me, if, to me, not only was he the conscience of America, but he was a central person in terms of bringing people together to think critically about how to get things done. I, 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 I take your point, Jules, uh, and agree with a lot of it. Um, just to um, interpret Kazen to Kazen a little bit, um, my point in the book, uh, American Dreamers, is really that the left helped to change public attitudes, but didn't, and this relates to what Morris was uh, asking about earlier, did not build institutions uh, that really were very durable to express you know, its vision. Um, and that goes to the lack of a, of a socialist party, um, and also, and, and one of the ways in which that made it uh, difficult for certain left views to gain a foothold is in actually talking about um, a more socialized economy, um, uh, or more socialized medical system, uh, or um, more socialized housing, uh, and more integrated uh, neighborhoods, economically integrated, um, uh, as well as racially integrated. All. Um, ideas which certainly uh, socialists believed in, but they were not able to uh, really make part of um, sort of mainstream discourse in the way uh, socialist parties in Europe were able uh, to do. And in the book, I go into some of the reasons for that. But I think in many ways, socialists are most successful at promoting you know, institutions which other people controlled. Now, there's good things about that. Obviously, the March on Washington was... Uh, was a wonderful event and it helped to kick off uh, the Black Freedom Movement. But the Black Freedom Movement, the the agenda that people like Barry Rustin, people like uh, like Harrington, uh, and people like King, for that matter, wanted to promote and were promoting in the in the march, which of course was entitled Job March for Jobs and Freedom, not just the March for Civil Rights or or something like that. And was of course funded in large part by the unions themselves, especially United Auto Workers. Um, was was an agenda which was the kind of agenda Michael you know, Harrington wanted to further. And what happened, as we know, is that what most Americans perceived about the agenda was that it was about enabling individuals to vote and live wherever they wanted to, if they could afford to live wherever they wanted to, and, and also marry a person of a different race, all individual rights which fulfilled uh, the equal rights, individual rights agenda. Um, in America, but the more collective rights agenda is something which was the particular, um, I think, agenda of, of the left, both the religious left and the secular left, and that agenda was much harder to promote, and would have been easier to promote, I believe, if there had been a, uh, a socialist party of, of some size, because third parties, which would have been a third party, would have you know, pushed the major parties to make these changes because, not just because they had good ideas, that's not the primary reason why major parties get pushed, because they would have lost votes if they didn't. Um, and, and that's one thing, you need that power. You need the electoral power. Michael understood that very well. That's why he, he tried to um, put together these uh, breakfasts at these midterm conventions that Democrats uh, started to have. In fact, he was one of the people who pushed the idea, I believe, of having these midterm conventions. But as he said, nice to have the midterm convention, but he couldn't get people out very interested in socialism. Uh, I think we're running uh, very close to the limit, so maybe just one last question, and then we'll segue quite uh, effortlessly and gloriously into the next panel. Yes? I saw a bumper sticker recently that, I will paraphrase, I don't remember it exactly, but it was, um, uh, socialize the cost, but privatize the profits, the American way. <laughs> it was, I had need to recruit that person. Anyway, I'm from S, uh, DSA, and I wanted to ask, since one of our more recent uh, flyers said nationalize the banks, and that was during the time when the banks were being bailed out, and the question of, of ownership was, uh, 
on the table, so to speak. And of course, we know what the result of that was. And in your uh, listing of the platform of uh, social democracy, I didn't pick up, maybe it was there, something about social ownership. You just referred to a socialized mm -hmm. economy, and it seems to me that is such an important part of a socialist economy, a socialist democratic economy. And I'm wondering if you would just comment on whether that was a missing strain in Harrington's writings, or it just hasn't been mm -hmm. brought to mm -hmm. our attention. That's a very good question. I mean, obviously, one of the things which Occupy Wall Street and Occupy movements elsewhere are focused on for good reasons, of course, is the financial um, the, the domination of the rest of the economy, um, not just here, but around the world. And uh, maybe Morris can, can, can talk about this, or Tom or somebody else who spoke before. I, I don't know. I don't, uh, in, in Michael's writing, I reread his books on socialism uh, to give this talk. I don't remember uh, him, him talking about that. Uh, you know, perhaps, you know, because, uh, as was mentioned before, his focus, Alan mentioned this before, his focus so much on production. His focus is so much about the workplace um, in the social tradition that the banks are almost in another world entirely, I think. Uh, and perhaps he believed that if we do that, then the banks, you know, if, if we have a more socialized uh, workplace, then the banks will have to lend to somebody. They'll have to lend to the people. It's a socialized workplace, too. Um, and, of course, we've learned... Uh, to our <laughs> in our pains uh, and travails over the last uh, few years, especially that uh, you know uh, finance capital uh, is not uh, is, is a very independent force in many ways, and um, if you if you don't rein it in and regulate it very severely, it's going to wreck the rest of the economy. But but uh, as far as I know, Morris, I don't know other people can mention that. I don't remember uh, hearing him hearing him write about that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>